name is Devanshi, and I'm joined here today with Mark as well. You can see him. He's here. Um, so Mark and I will be uh, kind of the Robins to Paula knows Batman today. We'll be helping her in the background, uh, responding to your questions in our chat and leading the Q&A afterwards. So while Paula is setting up, I just wanted to take a moment and introduce EduSmart to those of you who might not know who we are. I know we have a lot of pe people here today and a lot of people who will be watching this at home later. So for those of you who are new to EduSmart, we've been here since 2007 and we've been passionate about supporting science teachers and students by providing uh, standards-based content designed to engage students. Uh, our headquarters is here in Austin, but we support campuses all across Texas. In addition, our Florida expansion has been taking off thanks to the leadership and direction of Dr. Arlene Kaur. We serve over a thousand campuses in Texas and over 250,000 students and teachers. EduSmart is constantly being improved to reflect the ever-changing demands of our students. So as I said, Mark and I will be monitoring our chat box and uh, heading the Q&A at the end. So please, any questions you have, do let us know in our chat box. Um, so uh, without further ado, let me introduce Paula No. Paula No is an experienced consultant who works with educational tech companies, regional service centers, districts, and campuses focusing in the areas of user interface and user experience, instructional coaching, and innovative professional development aligned to best practices. During her 21 years in education, she has served with the district associate superintendent's office as an instructional leader tasked with improving teacher and administrator effectiveness. She's also the curriculum writer and professional development presenter. Uh, she is perhaps the most famous uh, uh, professional development development presenter because she is the most enthusiastic person I've ever met. So please give a warm welcome to Paula No. Devonshi, thank you for that engaging um, introduction. So I'm hoping that I live up to it. Uh, you lingered a little bit too long on the 21 years. <laughs> Good Lord, 21, okay. <laughs> So I'm going to say 21 because we're going to be short and sweet because of COVID, but here's the deal. I hope that um, my experience would say this about me, that I'm a difference maker because that's my heart. That's my intent. That's how I live my life. And that's how I see every single one of you in education. Uh, you guys are difference makers. So it's my goal to be um, a tool or something that you can leverage your game into a little bit stronger of a practice, um, having thought about a few things that I want to share with you today. So today's topic is doing more with less. Um, obviously, I picked this topic um, because it's very relevant to COVID and what we're going through right now. Um, too many times we are burdening people well-intended, great-hearted, hard-working people with the lift on so many things that they end up not getting anything off the floor. And so I want to look at a cognitive way to lift uh, that might be a little bit different than what's happening uh, in your teacher's practices or in your practice right now that will hopefully help ease the burden when it comes to the preparation, but not ease the cognitive load because we wanna make sure that that exercise is still powerful and is still present in those kiddos' lives. So let's move on, doing more with less, how to leverage one activity into multiple spaces. So I came up with a little acronym and then a symbol that really was powerful once I landed on it. Um, I don't think the acronym really is powerful, but I think the visual is. So keep in mind that there's four parts that I want you to focus on, always starting with the end in mind. Uh, then we've got to go to the beginning because we've got to figure out where we're actually starting. And then how do we get between the beginning and the end? And then how are we going to flex? And I think that visual uh, says it all, that we're going to head down the road uh, knowing where we need to get to, but we might be veering left uh, and taking some resources with us. So having said that, let's move forward to what I'm talking about. Here is an example of what it means 
for the end in mind. So the end in mind, this is a star release question with fifth grade science thinking aligned to the standards. Um, now, if you know anything about STAR, I mean, that's the point of reference that we need to uh, align our rigor and relevance to because it uh, checks on us to see if we have mastered uh, the state's intention of that science standard. This particular science standard is all about mixtures and solutions. Uh, but when you're looking at it, it's not crystal clear. It's not overly outspoken that it's about mixtures and solutions. So I just want to show you this because we're going to come back to this piece in a minute as you decipher the road that we need to go down uh, to get the kids where we need to get them. So I call this strategy, name it and work the box. Uh, we have many charts on our assessments. We have charts in the question and we have charts in the answer choices. And some people run away from charts. Um, they say their kids aren't any good at charts. And I'm gonna say the exact opposite. I say thank you to every chart that STAR gives us or we see in an assessment example because it's simply reading that's already scaffolded for me. It's beautiful. It already gives me categories. It puts things in an orderly format and it minimizes the key words and puts them all in alignment for me. So I say thank you, STAR, for helping us become stronger readers of critical information and giving me this tool such as a chart. So if you teach your kids and train your kids to leverage these types of resources that are already provided for you, your kids will start to see them as true scaffolding. Um, one other way that they can see this as true scaffolding is if you, the teacher, start giving your notes in chart-like format, because this is really 21st century scientific format when it comes to how kids are going to process information and how we, the people, process information on the internet um, and basically uh, through Google and social media. So let's just look at the key information from the chart. Um, obviously, in fifth grade, you have trained your kids to know that a mixture is a combination of two or more different objects that are very easy to separate. And a solution is a type of mixture where you have two or more ingredients, but they are not easy to separate. One of them will dissolve. And as one of them dissolves, it's going to appear to disappear. Well, you've obviously trained your kids if they're successful that the obvious opposite of disappear is to not disappear. It's to clump, to gather, to float, to sink. It's the, it's the exact opposite of disappearing. So let's look at the key words that STAR gives us here. It's all about naming it and work in the box. So our kids already know that iron filings are not going to dissolve in water because that's even in the teak. So we're going to take that one off the board and say most kids are going to get that. So that would be a mixture word. The next word they might not even know, papain. Let's just skip that one for now because that's what kids are going to do. Let's go to talcum powder. Kids might not even know what talcum powder is. So let's skip it for now and go to the next one. Vegetable oil. Kids obviously know by the fifth grade that oil and water do not mix because they are a mixture only. So I know that I have two mixtures, iron and vegetable oil, and then I have two unknowns. Well, let's start to look at what these unknowns may test out like for solutions or mixtures. So the key ingredient is going to be what happens when it settles. And so that's the end of the story. So the beginning is the name, appearance is how it looks, then I stir it. I don't need to look at it yet, but I really need to look at it after it stops. So when it settles, what is the verb? What happens? So as you notice right here, that particles settle to the bottom. Well, that's not disappearing. So that's obviously a mixture. It's clear and there's no visible particles. ding a ling a ling Those are my money words. That is a solution. Collected. It means the same as gathered or formed or floating. It's the opposite of disappearing. So if it's collected, that's not a solution. That's going to be a mixture. And then formed is definitely a mixture. So you can see just by this one strategy, 
it helps me frame this entire standard based on my keywords and how I need to connect it. So let's play this forward. So that's the end. Let's go to the beginning. So here's start. I say that you always should use predictable visuals and you should assess on application visuals. So the predictable visuals for this teak are salt and water, sugar and water, pepper and water, and iron filings and water, and then lemonade. So I'm always going to start with something very easy and familiar, um, and that would be salt and water or sugar and water. And so this would be an actual image that I would use as I start my instruction with mixtures and solutions. Next, I would scaffold the story early. I'm a huge believer when it comes to telling the story of the images in front of you and telling the story of the standard. And so much like I did when we talked about name it uh, in the box, we talked about mixtures that are easy to separate, uh, that are a combination of two or more ingredients and solutions are not. That's where something dissolves. You can see that I'm already going to start telling the story as I provide the anchor of support. Now, any anchor of support in my mind needs to have lots of images uh, that are applicable to move it forward, uh, that are similar in nature, but also different. And so you can see that we have solutions inside of mixtures because that's actually what it is. A solution is a type of mixture. And so this would be an example of a living anchor that we could add things to, but we would never take away from. And so this would grow over time throughout the year because hopefully once you get from physical properties of matter, mixtures and solutions, eventually you're going to teach earth science and you're going to start talking about some things that happen inside the earth. I think there's a place for you to scaffold this back but let's talk about that in one second. So I'm gonna to go to my last piece of scaffolding and then I wanna take some questions. So on this piece of scaffolding in the COVID world, I think that it's been really important to start thinking about leveraging your notes in your journal in an anchor kind of way, if you're not already doing it. So there was a training that I've done prior to called online journals and interactive anchors. Uh, that might be worth your while to go back and preview um, in case you missed that one. But I spent some time talking about the power of driving a visual literacy practice in an online journal where no child will ever leave their journal at home and no child will ever be without their journal. So I think that this plays into that same conversation. But when I'm talking about scaffolding support, for mixtures and solutions, I'm really thinking about big pictures because remember we're talking about doing more with less. And so that means I have less time. And so that means my conversations need to be really tight and really spot on. So when I'm thinking about mixtures and solutions, I'm gonna call it a power standard because it's how the physical properties are tested. So physical properties are not just a standalone, right? Volume, state, magnetism, density, conductor, insulator, solubility. Those aren't standalones, but guess what? Inside of a solution, I have to use a physical property to separate it out. So if I put iron filings in water, how do I get the iron out? Well, I use a magnets. Based on the physical property of magnetism, I can pull the iron out of the water because it is a simple mixture that's easily separated. Well, that's how I use those properties and I drag them forward into this, this talking point of mixtures and solutions. So you can see I have a quick, real easy a journal entry here, just reminding the students of the story of physical properties, that physical properties um, focus on the actual properties of the matter that we're talking about. And they can be sorted, they can be grouped, and they can be charted based on um, how they are defined according to these categories. And then here's a real simple mixture challenge that we might do as a class. Um, I was trying to think of a very collaborative way that you could do this particular mixture challenge. One way that you could do it is you could split the kids up into groups of three and each child comes up with their own 
ingredients for a mixture, but then they tag each other. The second child looks at the first child's list and then tells me what tools are gonna to need to be needed in order to separate it out and actually tells me about the process of separation. And then the third child records the data and writes up the summary statement. And so then I tag your it, then you um, might do the second part of my experiment and then my teammate might do the third part. So you're each doing the composing of the experiment, the um, actual experimental piece, and then the conclusion uh, piece of the experiment. So that's a way to do one experiment, but get three times the thinking inside that one experiment. So scaffold support, keeping all your conversations super tight. So before I move on, let me hear from you. Um, I want to hear what's one thing that I've challenged you with so far. You can either just turn on your mic. I welcome that. Or you can put it in the chat and let me address that. What's one thing I've challenged you with so far? What's one aha moment? And uh, or what's one question that you have for me at this point before we continue? Hi, I'm Miss Ortiz. How are you? I'm, I'm actually, I'm so sorry my camera's off. I, I, I do not like camera doing that, but I'm actually good. driving. We're so good. I, don't <laughs> I don't want anybody to see that, you know, I'm like staring at the road and not at the camera, but I am listening. So I do teach first grade, but this is my first year, I have to say, using this program. Yes. And I really love it because there's so many um, activities on there that are so engaging for my students. And they're able to actually, now that they, they are doing, um, well, some of them are, uh, virtually at home, they're able to actually do it right on the computer. But I did really like the way you set up that journal. And I'm kind of thinking right now in my mind, you know, something that I can actually do in reference to that with my students, that would be probably a little bit more user friendly for them, as well as like, probably like a dragging activity for them. Absolutely. So um, you probably you might even own OneNote interactive journal if you own the Microsoft suite of, pro of products. But then we also have some younger kids that are quite um, uh, seesaw wizards, I would say. So they use the seesaw format for their interactive journals. But I'm glad that you're thinking about that. You're thinking about what you can do to leverage and connect the learning and move it forward. So the great thing about Edge of Smart is that it is so rich in visuals that you need to hit the pause button and let EduSmart do the heavy lifting. Um, half of the work of good instruction these days is to make your teaching visual. Instead of just talking, it needs to be connecting, explaining, um, and questioning. And in order to do that, you've got to lean on some sort of resource. And unless you're curating your own videos or you know, spending hours on YouTube and Google or Google Image, I'm not saying it's not possible, but once again, I would prefer to buy back every educator's time and have them spend their time on coming up with the just right questions and how they're going to scaffold and leverage those questions instead of on the what they're going to teach or the how they're going to make it visual. Let's just hit the pause button on some of those visuals like I'm about to show you. And I will show you how I would scaffold questioning uh, from a beginner uh, knowledge like level one all the way to a master's level knowledge of let's just say four out of five. So I'm so glad that was a good question, a good a comment, Ortiz. Thank you so much. Um, I see some people talking about the interactive journals. I'll take one more question before I move on. So anybody else or comment? Okay, we're gonna move on now. So back to it. So um, as I share my screen, Devonchi, are we good there? Yep, all good. Okay, so here's an example of Polino sharing a visual by just hitting the pause button on um, an Edge of Smart lesson. So this particular um, story is in Edge of Smart on mixtures and solutions for fifth grade. And I just hit the pause button. Okay, uh, it tells the whole complete story, but um, I might have used this in day one of my first teach, but I also may come back to this particular image and I may just have this image paused on my screen. Um, and I'm going to ask the kids to do this in their journal or I'm going to ask them to do it online and put it in the chat for me. Write the steps out in order to separate this solution and mixture. And so this graphic came perfectly from EdgeSmart. 
And I'm going to tell you, if they can write the steps out correctly, they will meet the expectation. But that is too dangerous for us in the state of Texas. You never want to just meet it. You want to exceed it. You need to master it. And so the mastery level thinking is to actually draw a dot diagram of the particles of the matter for the salt solution and the mixtures of sand and water. And you may be saying, what's a dot diagram? Well, exactly. So that is the level of thinking down to the literal Petri dish level thinking that they're going to have to get to in order for us to say confidently that they can master it. And so there's some key vocabulary word that goes with it, but it goes back to the end and it goes back to the beginning. So remember we talked about with this particular standard, it's always tested visually. Um, and that it's about keywords and what is happening with the verbs. What is happening? Is it clumping? Is it gathering? Is it evenly separated? Uh, does it look like it's disappeared or is it sticking somewhere? And so when you explain that, if you scaffold that piece of the questioning back to the children, then they can go, oh, I know how I would draw those dots, group together, clump together sitting at the bottom, floating at the top, sticking on the side. Oh, okay. So I don't give them all the answers, but think about how you're going to scaffold your questions. And then if you're a new teacher or you're a new to subject teacher, um, or maybe just new to science teacher, you don't have to know everything, but you do have to be prepared. So that's the key thing, right? Is that you've got to be prepared enough to perform the science lesson and give feedback that's correct uh, because science is generally right or wrong. It's not gray very often. Um, and so that's where EduSmart comes in as well because EduSmart is deeply aligned to the standards. Um, it has stories, it has videos, it has formative assessments woven inside the videos, which are perfect because you don't have to figure out where to stop and start. Um, it can be used for synchronous, asynchronous, it can be assigned, it can be used for intervention, it can be used throughout the week, it can be used all at once. So it is so flexible going back to my initial graphic. Now you can see why I completely use it in almost every situation I go into, I come back to this product to help teachers so we can reach kids because that's the goal. So let's look at the answer. So there you go. Is that something that you would have drawn? The answer to a salt solution and sand and water. So it's not a perfect drawing, but you notice, what if I just gave them that drawing and told them to work backwards? What if I gave them the answer and said, what question is this about? If you've done your job well as an educator and you have taught your kids how to get dressed cognitively, that they know that the shoes go on after the socks and that they know where their shirt goes and where their shorts go, then they should be able to dress themselves cognitively, cognitively with this concept. Meaning if I see dots that are evenly spread out, I know evenly spread goes with the word solution. And I know solutions are tagged also with mixtures. And I know that that's something that I can separate matter based on the physical property of being soluble. So we connect all of those pieces of clothing or all those pieces of cognitive uh, words back together again in order to form the story. So keep making word connections, picture connections that go all the way back to the anchor and then all the way forward to the mastery level. You may think that it's not sticking, but it is. If you hold these high expectations that that's where we're gonna go, your kids will go with you. So let's go on. So let's change subjects. Let's go to um, predicting visuals, assessing on application visuals. So here is a density visual. This is a density column, very familiar. Uh, kids can read it, kids can enjoy that, right? So that would be the start, the beginning visual. Now let's go to what it might look like with a little bit more of a predictable uh, visual after this, but first we have to scaffold the notes. So scaffolding the notes uh, would look the similar way, except we would sub out mixture and we would put density column over here. And you notice that we're still on physical properties of matter. So now we're looking for an application practice. But before we get there, 
I have to know for sure that my kids can tell the story of an image. And so in order to do that in a remote atmosphere, if I'm not actually talking with the students and listening to them tell me the story and actually give me challenges back and answer my challenges, for instance, the plastic block is more dense than what liquid and less dense than what liquid. If I'm not providing that kind of feedback in a small group or in a, um, a classroom setting or in a feedback setting, I need to make sure that I have some sort of formative assessment that is going to walk them down the path I want them to go. So I'm gonna lead them down this path of this kind of comparative thinking because that is how it's tested and that's actually how it's read. And so I'm gonna create something like this in order to check the understanding. But remember, that's not where we're going to stop. Scaffolding is not where we stop. It is a landmark along our road. So where we're gonna stop is to master that expectation. So remember earlier I talked to you about bringing things forward into the next strand of curriculum. So this is how mixtures and solutions is tested out or physical properties is tested out inside of our science. I took a screenshot of an earth science picture out of a story in EDGESMART. And uh, this is water as a force, I believe in fifth grade. And it's already told us the story of, of ice wedging and the water um, melted, which means the temperature was obviously above zero degrees. And it ran down the hill and it fell into the riverbed and the riverbed is flowing. And so EDGESMART has done this beautiful job of telling this very dynamic story with arrows, with keywords on the screen, and then stopping and answer, asking kids the just right questions. So I simply hit the pause button as a teacher and I'm gonna ask these three questions. What's happening to the sediment? And I'm gonna let a child answer that. And I, I don't know what I'm gonna get, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna leverage whatever I get up to the next level because I'm gonna be prepared with my questions. So if a child says, oh, I see the sediment here, I see it's all over the place, it's in the river. You're exactly right, where is it in the river? Well, it's towards the top. Well, it's kind of everywhere. Okay, it's everywhere in the river. Well, what does the river sit on? So I think that that's the first question because a lot of students don't know that water sits on land. They won't be able to say it or claim it as a scientific fact. So you may have to give them that fact that water does sit on land. This is called the land form that's at the bottom of a river and its name is a river bed. And so this sediment, sediment is a tiny little piece of our surface that has been weathered into very small pieces called sediment. And then that rock continues to get broken down and it travels either by wind, by water or ice until that sediment is put down someplace. So are we in the beginning, the middle or the end of this story for that little sediment? And then the child might say, well, it's not the beginning and the arrows, I guess it's in the middle. You're exactly right. But some of the sediment is falling. And I would say, why is this happening? And hopefully I would get a child to tell me about the physical property of density, right? Because objects that are more dense than water sink, objects that are less dense than water float. And so this sediment must be more dense than water. So it's going to fall out of the water and land on the riverbed. And then the riverbed is going to increase creating new land. So, that would be a master level thinking on moving a simple topic such as density, right? Or sediment or why this would be called a mixture because sand does not dissolve in water. It's going to fall out somewhere. It's never going to dissolve um, into a new topic. And then the end of the story is what happens to that sediment? Well, if it washes all the way out, it's gonna land in the mouth of a river. And that mouth of a river is called a delta. And this is what a delta looks like. And then I would probably assign a quick write based on this edge of smart image. And I would give them a little feedback. The earth surface is constantly changing slowly due to weathering, erosion and deposition. Tell me the story 
from beginning to end as a delta is formed. And then anytime I give a quick write, I always give money words. You have to underline my money words, right? You've got to, if you don't, if you need to liven up your response, I'm going to need some more money words. And these are the key words that I need you to put in your response. And so that instantly sets the floor of my response to them and of their response back to me. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I don't know what you're thinking so far, but I'm thinking this lesson is good to go for somebody. This makes me kind of excited for you guys. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move forward. Anytime we do science training, anytime I do a science classroom, I do an oh snap and I throw up a quick cir circuit practice question. And it's a big game. It's a challenge with the kids instantly. If they were uh, not paying attention, then they are paying more attention now. Um, and I would just say, hey, where are you going to place switches for only two devices to work? And then where are you going to put them for four devices to work? Ready, go. And I set a timer. And then I have kids leaning in and studying and drawing and telling the story of a circuit. Yes. They love, it. they love it. They love it. And I don't do a whole day of circuits. Once I've taught it, I just come in with an oh snap at Is least once or twice a week. To me? A picture. I heard it too. So back to the beginning. Um, always start with the end in mind. Then you've got to go to the beginning and you've got to use some predictable visuals with your notes. And then you need to end up with more application visuals as you get towards the end of your concept. And that's how you're gonna test your concept is with these visuals. You need to scaffold along the way and make sure that you remain flexible and that you leverage some of these just right pieces that are already done for you into multiple different spaces. Now you notice that um, inside that training that I just gave you, that I talked about how do you leverage inside of First Teach. You heard me telling stories. You saw me leveraging it with notes. You saw me leveraging it with some challenge questions that could go into the synchronous chat. Um, you saw me leveraging it by pausing and putting a picture up and posing questions. So that's more of a formative assessment piece. You saw me turn the formative assessment piece into something really rigorous. And then you saw me apply a quick write to practically the same picture. So I think that um, using Edge of Smart um, saves you a lot of time. It saves you a lot of effort when it comes to doing the cognitive lift with the stories. Uh, because once again, it's, it's pieced together as a product that not only has stories, that are heavily visual. Uh, it also has good assessment questions and formative assessments built in, right? Which is the one thing that teachers struggle with sometimes is stopping and asking a question, right? It's got lab activities. It's got some interact interactivities and lab simulations, which is critical. And then for science in general, it just smart has done a fantastic job of putting the lab equipment and how it's tested inside the stories. Because that is definitely one piece teachers are not thinking about doing at all, is busting out the beakers and doing the film demos themselves. And if they are, kudos to them. That's always a great place. But wouldn't it be great if it was already in the notes, the video notes that you were giving the kids? It's already in the stories. And so add to that an interactive glossary, uh, some uh, journal prompts, and some assessment questions and um, a data center that tells you how much time they spend, uh, that they get the answers right, what's their score, so you can do some data tracking. I think it's a fantastic uh, program, and I can't think of a situation that I don't cur currently try to leverage it in uh, to help teachers at whatever, whatever level they are be successful. So for now, um, that is it. And I want to thank everybody on the call. I know Mark, uh, a number one sales guy for Edge of Smart is on the call. Um, um, I would love to field any questions that you may have for me at this time. Uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I do campus wide PD. I do webinars, um, obviously uh, for that. I do some teacher consultations and I also do uh, educational planning. So let me know if I can be available.
uh, to any of you guys. I would greatly appreciate that. Just reach out to me and I can reach right back. Um, so at this time, uh, you can turn on your mic or you can text me a question. Um, then we'll move forward. Devonshi, do you want anything you want me to answer at this point? Uh, would you mind putting in your email in the chat if you yes, are asking? I will. For that? And I'm going to move to that slide. So let me screen share again. Here we go. <laughs> so here's my information. And then I'll put Edge of Smart's information up in just one second. So Devonchi, any questions for me? Uh -huh. So far, we have Mark writing uh, EduSmart has simulations that include lab reports, also in CER format. Nice because all materials and equipment are provided virtually. Uh, Dr. Ava Rosales is writing the simulations and interactivities are a good virtual lab experience for students. Absolutely. Super important. So I'm going to go ahead and put up EduSmart's uh, information. Um, and I'll just stay on the call for a little bit. Um, I have not ever uh, put this in a place um, where any teacher has ever said, I don't want it or I don't use it. Uh, the only time that happens is when they don't know anything about it. Um, like many resources that sometimes our school purchase for us, for us and then we don't know how to leverage them. Uh, once it's explained uh, the different ways that it can be agile and flexible for them and it can come alongside a strong teacher's uh, program and processes and skill set and make them even better and take the lift off. Uh, never have I ever heard anything but outstanding things about this product. Uh, it doesn't replace a teacher, but I have used it to replace teachers. Uh, where I've had teachers that have been MIA or um, out on leave and I've had to use perhaps a librarian as my fifth grade science teacher, believe it or not. So I've put it into places where I had no teacher and got kids successful. Um, they need to hear the story. They need to see the story. They need to be interacting with some lab simulations. Um, and then they need to see how it all pieces together. Um, so whatever your skill set, I think there's a place uh, for this product. And then um, if you um, are just listening to the training, uh, just because you are curious about the topic, I really want you to keep this in mind. This is probably the number one thing I help teachers with is doing more with less, because we've got to figure out a way to buy back some of your time and energy in order to still get high quality results and engagement with kiddos. Um, I think we all know that this is perhaps not going away anytime soon, but we need to be able to, to do it better and better as the weeks go on. And I think doing more with less is the exact ticket uh, for you. Paula, we do have some questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so for those of you who didn't see, Mark has put in a link in our chat. If you wanna see what Paula's talking about, but haven't had the chance to view EduSmart yet, please click our preview request link and you can, <clears throat> excuse me, you can get a glance at that. Cynthia has a question. Uh, do you do presentations for grades seven through 12? Absolutely. Marlene, best practice is still best practice. Uh, Marlene uh, wrote that she is very new to this program this year and she's learning to introduce this to her first grade students. And this was very informative. Great. Uh, Megan has a question. Does EduSmart have resources for pre-K? No, but I would say, um, look at the kindergarten um, resources if you have um, access to them. Uh, because I have several campuses, um, even kindergartners are leveraging up their practice based on first grade, depending upon what district and what the district pro protocol and curriculum looks like. Uh, some districts in the state of Texas do what's called uh, concept uh, kindergarten. So they teach concepts and then they put the curriculum inside of the concept. So they try to do one main theme concept, such as I'll just make something up. Let's just say butterflies. Um, okay, well, we've got, we're gonna teach uh, literacy through butterflies. We're gonna teach science through butterflies. We're gonna teach writing through butterflies and math through butterflies. That was a little bit of a crazy example, but I think you know where I'm going with that. So if you're a teacher that wants a little more um, 
programmed, um, more standards aligned instruction. Um, I think that you should look at the kindergarten resources uh, for your pre-Kers. Um, and I think they can handle that. Um, I'm noticing that in several districts that I've done some consulting on, uh, we're starting to have that conversation. So they're inviting kids into this world of scaffolding their learning and moving, moving the standards-based learning along. Thank you, Paula. Sure. Any more questions? Well, as we wrap up, um, I'm going to say thank you. So not only thank you for being here, but just thank you for what you do. It's not too often um, I get to um, sit in a room of people that are the tip of the sword. But if you're on this call, uh, you most certainly are the tip of the sword out there. So thank you for making a difference uh, with your teammates. Thank you for making a difference with teachers or your coworkers, definitely students. Uh, but bigger picture for me in this world is uh, the communities and my country. Thank you for making a difference and fighting in this arena uh, for kids to have uh, the best education possible. And I know that that's true uh, when you show up. And so please be gracious to yourself. Some days we don't show up as strong as we would like, but any day that you show up is a good day for kids. So thank you for being here and thank you um, for what you're passionate about. And um, hopefully we'll see you soon. All right, bye for now.